today. Thank you so much. I'm privileged and thrilled to be able to be here with you, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I'm Thank already you. appreciating to see your passion and excitement. It means you love what you do, so that's good. <laughs> It is. It's grateful. And in days like today, when I record these podcasts, that I just I'm filled with excitement and energy, and it carries through. Once I hit like, you know, stop, we jump off the meeting. I'm like, the whole day is a whole other day after such these conversations, and I'm really excited to to jump in with you. And I think you. what would be apropos to kick off a a conversation with you um, would be with me asking you what would be what's one of your favorite jokes that you would like to open up with. You know, it says in Talmud that a good way to warm up the crowd before they hear something important or deep is to say a joke. You like to open up with jokes? What's something that, what's something that comes to mind? So I'll share a joke that I just shared today. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, uh, I had a Zoom with the South African Jewish community, so I opened with this one. There was basically a teenager who was uh, studying for his finals on European history. So uh, he turns to his father and he says, Daddy, Daddy, I need some information here, you know, for my homework. Who is responsible for starting the First World War? How did the First World War begin? His father was ignorant. He knew, he knew nothing about history, but he didn't want to embarrass himself. So he says, uh, I think Belgium invaded Holland. And that's how the First World War began. Problem is his wife, wrote her doctorate in European history. She was a teacher of history and she overheard it in the kitchen. So she, for her, this was an unforgivable crime to make such a horrible error. And she says, what are you draining a cup as they say in Yiddish? What are you hacking a shine? How could you distort history so much? Belgium invaded Holland. That's not how World War I began. It's not what happened. It's basically Gavrila Princip uh, shot the ear of the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire on June 18th, 1914. That's how First World War began in Sarajevo. He says, if you continue preaching your ridiculous history to our son, he's going to grow up as ignorant and clueless and foolish as you. Of course, the husband got insulted and he says, who asked you to mix in? He never asked you the question. Stop mixing into my life. Stop insulting me. And what do you think you know about history? You know nothing. And the boy speaks up and he says, okay, daddy, I know how the first world war began. Got it. <laughs> that was today's joke. I love it. I love it. Wow. Do you have uh, at one point you wrote, you know, you have so many different articles out, but perhaps one day you'll compile all the jokes that you put together and perhaps uh, the humor of Rabbi Huawei. I love that. I love, I love the one that you mentioned. I've heard it recently um, where you, it's the son who's talking to her. His mom, mom says, Hey, can you go to the back porch? It's dark outside. Can you get me the broom? The, the, the boy is like, mom, I'm scared of the dark. And here I am saying you're a joke, but I think the listeners may enjoy it. And it may segue into something. And the boy says, I'm scared of the dark. The mom's like, don't worry. God's out there. God's there. He'll watch over you. The boy's like, really? God's out there in the dark in the back of the porch. He'll be there. He's watching over me. Sure, go. You'll be okay. So the boy timidly walks to the back door, opens it up, peeks his head out and says, God, if you're there, can you please hand me the broom? <laughs> yeah, but I will tell you, Mayor, huh? I will tell you, if you want to know the joke for all the years, I always try to begin lectures with jokes, not always, but very often because it, uh, it opens up people's hearts. It also removes stereotypes. Sometimes I speak to audiences and the fact that I'm wearing a, a kippa, a yarmulke, I have side locks, I have a beard, I look like an observant Jew somewhat. Sometimes very secular audiences or non-Jewish audiences could look at me and like, you know, where's, where did he land from, you know, from which planet and how is he going to teach us about life? Yeah. And the fact that we can laugh about the same things and ultimately cry about the same things really just brings out the inner unity that we're all vulnerable and we're all sensitive and we're all human and we all long for transcendence and meaning and belonging and attachment so humor really i always found to be a very good icebreaker and psychologically it opens opens people up yes yeah, so, so by now in this podcast i do hope that the listeners are somewhat warmed up to to you and to and to us in this conversation 
And, uh, and as we delve into this, I mean, even just now in your latest, what you just said, like you speak in a way which is quite different. The vocabulary and the terminology is a bit different from the typical rabbi or observant looking Jew in your position with the, psych- like the positive psychology that you infuse within your, your talks and, your, and the way you approach problems or how you talk about God and that relationship. All of that is so different and so fresh and so unique. I, I wonder, where was there a defining moment or where in your history did you start developing that voice, this approach to sharing in the way that you do? Wow, that's, that's a wonderful question. So I cannot pinpoint a defining moment. Maybe there was, but not con- I, I can't pinpoint consciously. You know, this was, this was the moment, you know, when as soon as I hear people's stories, you know, I, I, I went to this place and, and my life was changed forever. I, I don't have such a moment. But I did grow up in a home that was culturally quite open. My late father was a Jewish journalist for more than 50 years. Uh, He worked for various newspapers around the world, including for Israel's largest daily, the Yotachronot, and then he ultimately opened up his own Yiddish newspaper. So the guests that frequent our home, that the guests that frequented our home and the types of conversations in our home, I think opened me up to uh, a lot of diversity in the world. Then when I myself came of age, I traveled a lot. I've met a lot of people. I always tried to listen, um, to educate myself, to open myself up to different experiences, especially in my own inner work, in my own spiritual and emotional and psychological growth. I guess it just all came together Mm. um, in my soul, in my brain, in some way. And then when I realized that uh, it seems like part of my mission in life is to share and communicate and inspire, I just felt this is the most penetrating, effective, and powerful way to really allow people to open themselves up to deeper states of consciousness. Mm. I mean, and you do such a great job at it. I mean, you, did you feel like that the, the home that you brought up in was it conducive to to challenging questions, to challenge the effort to the mainstream? Was there was there space to be yourself or to question the things that you were being taught? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my father was one of the least judgmental people I think that I have ever met. He himself he grew up in the hell of Stalin's communism. And it left such an impression on him that anything that was censored triggered him in very profound ways. He could not deal with censorship. He could not deal with people trying to control other people's minds, other people's mouths, and other people's souls. So we grew up with a very deep rooted uh, denigration and hatred to that type of tyranny mm. and control. I remember I was a kid, this is 1981, the Yiddish editor of a newspaper called MS. Now you have to realize the humor. MS means truth. In Russia, there was a newspaper Pravda, which means truth, but they also had a Yiddish newspaper called MS, which means truth. Now, I'm not always a fan of newspapers. My grandfather used to say when he wanted to uh, trigger my father, he would say (laughs) that all newspapers are lies and everything that says in the newspaper is a lie, even the date, because it was printed yesterday. (laughs) But within, uh, my father was a newspaper man, but within newspapers, I could guarantee you that the newspaper called Truth in Yiddish in Moscow probably didn't have even 2% of truth in it. It was absolute communist propaganda. They even titled it MS. They didn't spell it in the Hebrew. MS is Aleph Mem Tuf, three letters of the Hebrew alphabet. They spelled it Ayin Mem Ayin Samach, which was even a distortion of the word truth. So the very name was a distortion. And the editor-in-chief, who was an absolute communist agent, came to the United States to persuade American jury that communist Russia is a paradise. So he came to our house because my father had 
the biggest Yiddish newspaper at the time, or one of the largest Yiddish newspapers of the Algemeiner Journal. So he came to my house to persuade my father that he should give good publicity to communist Russia. And my father interviewed him for hours, and my father published the entire interview without censorship, where Mr. Vergilis, Aaron Vergilis, is extolling the virtues, the beauty, the exquisiteness, the liberty, the cultural freedom in, in the Soviet Union. This is 1981. And my father prints the interview without censorship. People were horrified with him. How do you, how do you become a channel for such lies and deception, you know, our animal farm? Yeah. The next week, my father wrote an editorial. And the way he began the editorial is, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I'm not an American who read, you know, American propaganda. I grew up in the Soviet Union. And he describes his youth. He describes what his parents went through. His father was taken Friday night in the middle of Kiddush during the 1938 purges, arrested, tortured, exiled to the Gulag, almost killed, made it out a broken man. He describes his relatives his visit there in the 1970s. And he concludes his article, he says, Mr. Vergilis, please don't sell me the lies about the Soviet Union. One of the worst, worst hells ever created for mankind in the annals of human history, around mm. 30 or 40, some say 50 million deaths. So I think in my home, there was a certain, uh, my father and by extension, all of us were very allergic to controlling minds, to censoring information, and not to allow truth to speak for itself. My father told this to me maybe a hundred times. He says, the first thing that dictators do, this was a classic of this. The first thing dictators do is they create a bureau for truth and information. <laughs> the Stalin did this and Hitler did this, the first thing. In other words, they make sure that all the information is channeled through them. Because once I could control the information that comes to you, I can control everything. As Jefferson famously explained the difference between free government and free press. Right. Wow. So that's, I mean, so there's, it seems like the humor and the wit and the, and the wisdom has, it's just, it was embedded within you from a very young age, from your grandfather to your father. And now, now you're a great catalyst to share that with, with the world. Your um, your brilliance is it's quite well known from a very young age. I'm not here to fluff you up too much, but the truth, the facts are the facts. At, at age 15, you're you're a chaser for uh, for the Rebbe, which for those who do your not audience know, audience knows what that means, a chaser for the Rebbe. Well, I was going to jump right into it, but if you want to explain what you did, you can. But in short, in short, you, you could correct me where I'm wrong. But long story short, the Lubavitcher Rebbe would uh, talk. Of uh, hours at, at length on Shabbos, on Yom Tov, on times where one could not record what he was saying. So there was a team of, of individuals who would go and listen and hear and remember all that was said. And then afterwards, when it was appropriate to write, they would write down and record every, and then record everything that was, that was said. And you, at the tender age of 15, at 15 years old, we were able, was able to remember and be part of this elite team of people who were able to remember what was said absorb it, and then transmit it afterwards. Correct? How about how to do this so far? Yeah, correct. Excellent, Mayor. Thank okay. You. All right. Whew. My Mishpia would be happy to hear. So now, my, where I'm going with this is that, so at 15, you're 15 years old, you have this brilliant mind. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious to know, like, first of all, just technically, like, was there a certain task? Did you find a way to clear your mind before you delved into this job, into this task at hand? What, how did you prep before going that's, into this? That's, that's a great question. So I have an older brother who some of you know, many of you know, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, the author of Towards a Meaningful Life. And he, he's 16 years older than I am, was part of this group. And he actually also worked with my middle brother, Rabbi Baruch Jacobson. And when I was a little kid, I was a little child, Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory would hold a public gathering almost every Sabbath, almost every Shabbat and holidays, and they would go for many hours. They could go anywhere from three hours to six hours, sometimes seven, eight hours. 
On holidays, he would sometimes speak four days, and each each address can last a few hours. So altogether, you're talking about 10, 12, 15, 20 hours of talk. And when I was younger, I just, I developed a certain niche, I guess, which my brother identified. So when I was a young teenager, a little after my bar mitzvah, he summoned me into the team. It was incredibly, incredibly challenging for so many reasons. Number one, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was an extraordinarily brilliant man who mastered really all of the branches of Torah wisdom, philosophy, mysticism, Kabbalah, Hasidic thought, Talmud, biblical studies, Jewish law, halacha, what's known as Rishonim, Acharonim, all of the various components of machshava, hashkafa, ethics, Legalistics, com legalistic components, Maimonides, Rashi, Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, the various halachic works over the generations, and all of the mystical writings. And he really contained them, but he also had tremendous knowledge in a lot of the secular sciences, science, physics, mathematics, engineering, algebra, trigonometry, modern physics, astrophysics, cosmology, geology and history and current events. And his talks were really a mosaic that synthesized all of these branches of wisdom and always with contemporary applications because he wasn't only a great scholar, he was also a very sensitive, visionary and leader. And he had his finger on the pulse of the people. So to listen to the Rebbe for a few hours was an intellectually and emotionally and spiritually transformative experience. To memorize it though and transcribe it was not easy to put it mildly. And I think it was like, probably one of the, till today I have to tell you, Saturday night, my wife knows, I get a little bit into a bad mood. <laughs> and not because I am so sensitive to the spirituality of Shabbat departing, maybe subconsciously too, but because it triggers what Saturday night was in my life. You know, all my friends would go for pizza or bowling or just chill out, whatever they were doing Saturday night. But I knew it's going to be an all-nighter because we're going to start writing down the talks of the Rebbe. Probably the most important prerequisite to be able to memorize and to be able to be involved in this was two things. Number one, continuous and diligent learning of the Rebbe's works and teachings to understand his methodology, his style, his approach, because he was an extremely systematic thinker, very organized thinker, uniquely organized thinker. In fact, the Rebbe today is known as a social activist, but really by nature, he was much more of an internal thinker. His social activism came out of a necessity of what he felt was God's mission but it was an extremely organized thinker. So the more one can delve into that, the more it made you prepared. You also had to try to learn and master as much material as you can generally, because he was always quoting from here and there, and he wouldn't give you notes before to read from. He wouldn't read from notes. But in addition to that, I think the most important thing that I found was, and my brother shared this with me also a few times because he was part of that team, was the ability to really be able to listen. To really be able to listen is not as easy as one would imagine. Listening means, and I'm going to say it maybe a little dramatically, is that when the Rebbe is talking, I don't exist. There's no I. The mind is completely vacant, an open conduit and channel just to absorb. No opinions, no critique, no compliments. I remember once the Rebbe said something, it was brilliant. And I tell myself, wow, that was good. You would think that would be helpful. It ruined it. I forgot that talk mm -hmm. because my intellectual ego asserted itself and started to give opinions. That was good. You're great. You're excellent. No, no, no. You're not a student anymore. Now you're a critic. Now you have opinions. You know why children remember everything and they'll remind you 20 years later what you told them at the age of four 
Why is that? They actually listen. They're wet sponges. They absorb everything. We, as adults, it's very hard for us to listen. Even if you're sitting at the most brilliant lecture in the world, usually when the person is speaking, you're telling yourself, that's good. I'm going to make a YouTube video of that. He's brilliant. I'm getting him on my show. You're not listening to him. You have opinions about him. That's how we all listen. So I learned that early on. When the Rebbe starts talking, I am not present. Completely open. It's called emptying out, in, in Kabbalistic terminology, it's emptying out the vessel of all of your own toxicity and all of your own ideas about life and just allowing this energy to flow through you later you're going to have to reassert yourself and, and try to retain it i mean that's an incredible like how does one even go about at such a again young age you're in your teens how do you go about practicing such such a deep way of just existing of being ultimately present in the moment yeah, to just so, so actually i was not told to do it i just i learned it from from instinctive experience that when i did it i realized when i was just allowing myself to be mesmerized that's when it, you know that's uh, when it. mark twain mark twain once wrote he said when god created the grand canyon he did not create the adjectives with which to describe it <laughs> Sometimes you just have to allow yourself to melt away in the experience. Don't give words. You don't have to give it words. You don't have to describe it. Describing it, language is wonderful, but it also limits every experience. So in real listening, even though the person is communicating through language, but for me to get it, I cannot confer language upon it. Mm. I just had I, I to allow myself to be mesmerized, to, to melt away in the experience. Sometimes a hug could be more powerful than I than I love you, you know. Yes, yeah. Just, a hug, even the gaze of the eyes, the eyes to eyes. Powerful. That gaze, yeah, because it captures an emotion or sentiments that often language will limit and define. So even though we are creatures of language and we cherish language, and I certainly should be the last one to criticize language as how I make my living and put bread on the table but we also have to always be aware that language is a trap because it captures everything and defines it and then we close the lid on it yeah you know i tell always my students i said when i look at a raisin the moment i say this is a raisin or the moment i say this is a cup the story is over it's a cup that's it i know everything about it you ever saw a two-year-old or a one-year-old in the crib looking at a cup or looking at a raisin? They could look at it for 45 minutes from all angles. You know why? Because they don't give it a name. By not giving it a name, they actually remain open to the experience that language really limits. So it's important to always have that ability to be in the world of language, but then to remember that we have to transcend the world of language. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, once what, heard, I once heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, it says about Moses that he couldn't talk. He told God, I'm not a man of words. So he said, the real reason is because Moses lived in a world that transcends language. He could not put a limit on anything because he always saw things as reflecting their infinite source. So there's no language. Very powerful idea. That is quite powerful. I mean, there, there has, I mean, though, it, I mean, maybe I'm going a little off tangent here, but there, that seems so vast and so tremendous. But for us in this world that we're talking about, we, we, we automatically as humans process limitation of our, our way of being, but we put labels or we put people into certain boxes and we need to, and even for our own lives, can't be so open because then there's so many options and then we get lost and confused. And for someone like with so many talents, where do I, you know, where do I go with it? How do I achieve it? So where's that fine balance between staying open and curious and not labeling and yet also living in a realistic li great, great, life? Great, great, wonder, great, wonderful question. And uh, there's a lovely Talmudic story that on the holiday of Sukkot, which is considered the holiday of joy, the greatest sages and leaders would juggle. They would juggle torches. They would juggle glasses of wine. They would juggle eggs. And you're talking about 
the top tier of Jewish scholarship and leadership were juggling eight torches, four torches, 12 torches. Like, what was, what, what, what was that about? Like, it, it's nice to have a good show, a good, a good juggling show, but you had here literally Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, I mean, top Talmudic sages, Abaye, Rav Levi. So uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe once explained on Sukkot, he said something magnificent. He said, the art of life is juggling. Because when you juggle, you know, you throw one ball up, the other one comes down. But when it comes down, the other one goes up. There's two ways of living. I call them, for those of you who still remember listening to the radio, Aloha Shalom, somewhat Aloha Shalom. <laughs> there's AM and there's FM, right? You remember AM and FM? So if you go to AM, the world is coming to an end within the next hour. <laughs> Whether you love Trump or you love Biden, you're pro-global warming or against global warming, between coronaviruses and pandemics, politics and everything else, and within the next hour, the world should be coming to an end. That's AM radio. You go to FM radio, Brilliant. Calm, yeah. calm world, calm world. And the question is, which station, where should you live? Should you live in AM? Should you live in FM, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a marriage, sometimes one of the spouses is AM, one spouse is FM. So the spouse who's in AM look at the spouse of FM, and then you're out for lunch, you're detached, you live in the heavens, I can't be with you. And the one on FM is like, you need therapy, you're traumatized, you're triggered, you don't know how to chill out, you don't know how to relax. And that's the art of juggling. The art of juggling is that a part of me always remains above. But a part of me has the courage to be able to come down below. And that ability to vacillate freely between the world in which we impose language and confer definitions on things so that we can survive. So when I say pass the apple, you don't pass a sledgehammer, right? And when I say give me a hug, right, you don't shoot me. Mm -hmm. In order to be able to survive in that world where language and communication is essential for life, but always to be able to know that I have to keep a channel, I have to keep a link open with the satellite above where I should never feel the need to put a lid on the box and just believe that I know the whole story. I should always be able to be curious and inquisitive and open, especially when it comes to the yourself and people around you. One of the great tragedies in life is when we tell stories about ourselves consciously and subconsciously, and we never revisit those stories. We put our spouses in boxes and we never revisit them. We put our children in boxes. And really it's just our definition of those experience. And those definitions may be horribly impoverished based on our own wounds and scars. And this is where you have to realize how part of us has to remain uninhibited and free to explore. So that's a great, that's so great. And I love where we're going with that. And with, with what you were saying here, there, there, there are so many types of limitations and stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and we tell about others. But then we also fall into these blind spots of like, this is, we don't even know, we don't, you know, we know what we don't know, but how do we find out the things that we don't know that we don't even know about? So, and that's how it shows it's up. Most of reality, which is most of reality. Mm -hmm. What I know I don't know is wonderful, but what I don't know that I don't know is 99.9% .9 of reality. Yeah, that's a big right? piece of the pie. <laughs> and so if somebody is, wants to go about that journey and, and discovery, how would they go about that? And, and, to, and that's something I've asked, I'll be honest, I've asked that question in the past in some of the podcasts with people who are psychologists or life coaches and such. Um, but here's a unique opportunity perhaps to ask that question, but through the prism of a say Torah um, or something, because I think people sometimes get scared about when we start talking about this type of language, is this Jewish, is this kosher, is this healthy? What's it tied to? Where's the source? Um, we get lost in that jargon. And I think there's so much healing to be said in this conversation. How would you tie it back into a place where it's like, no, this is truth. This is, you know, this is, this is real. This is God. Wonderful, wonderful. 
not only is this Judaism, it's the essence of Judaism. I'm going to tell you a teaching of the great Magad of Mizrich. The Magad of Mizrich was the famous successor of the Baal Shem Tov and the second master in the history of Hasidism. He died in 1772 on the 19th of Kislev. He's known as Rabbi Dov Ber of Mizrich. Just a little interesting historical point, and that is when Carl Jung, Carl Jung, the famous student of Sigmund Freud, and one of the only non-Jews in Freud's minion, they used to say that Freud, if he wasn't such a heretic and didn't hate religion so much, could have had a minion for Mincha every day in his office. The, the, <laughs> oh, the only one who would pray would be Carol, Carol Jung, who wasn't Jewish. So Hilarious. I, I read an interview, it's fascinating, with him when he was 80 years old. And I kid you not, I could send you a copy of it. Somebody sent it to me like 15 years ago. And somebody asked Jung, who is responsible for molding your Welt on Schauung, specifically the idea of collective unconscious. He believed in this inner unconscious unity of all of us. And he says, a man who died in the 1700s and his name was Rabbi Dov Bear of Mizrich. Wow. The Hasidic master. And he quotes different things that he learned from him about ayin, about going into a state of, of, of no thingness from which all the somethingness comes from. So I'm, I'm mentioning this just to reference the power of the teachings of the Magad of Mizrich, even on a man like of Carol Jung, who had such a major empire, but no, very few people would know to trace that back to the Hasidic master, the Magad of Mizrich, who was also the teacher of the founder of Chabad, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi, who was a student of this man of Mizrich. Mizrich is a city in Ukraine. He has a wonderful teaching, very meaningful, on the opening verse of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But there are two superfluous words there, et hashamayim et ha'aretz, which are not necessary. And they come from the word os, which means letters. He says, in the beginning, God created the letters of heaven and the letters of earth, meaning, Pre-creation, the whole world was here. Everything was here. God didn't change, the prophet says in Malachi. Everything was here pre-creation just as it was post-creation. You know what changed? Language. In the beginning, what we call the Big Bang, the moment of beginning, when time was created, space was created, matter was created, what happens? He created letters for heaven and earth. He created language for heaven and earth. And that changed reality. Because today we know in physics, in linguistics and psychology, our language of reality defines reality, especially in the world of quantum physics. My language defines reality. Max Planck said, matter, is a derivative of consciousness. Consciousness is not a derivative of matter. Matter exists because I think it exists. My perspective on reality, my language on reality is what defines reality. A different language is a different reality. So the difference between pre-creation and post-creation is not reality. It's pre-creation. The posture of reality was an expression of infinity. So if I would look at myself, I would not have language to define myself. I would see my posture as being rooted in the infinite source of the Godhead, and I am a manifestation of the infinite light. That's how I would perceive myself. Once language is introduced, now there is already an ability for separation, for fragmentation, and ultimately for trauma. What is trauma if not the stories I tell myself about myself that restrict me and now I'm operating from a very, very narrow and limited place. And everything you tell me is being filtered through those very narrow stories which all originate in language. So we live in a world of language, but to be in a relationship with reality, I always have to be able 
to straighten up and lift myself up and allow my posture to be rooted in infinity and not allow it to become contained and confined in a box of language, which will inevitably result in stories that will limit my creativity, dampen my joy, and tell me that I am incapable of real love and real connection. Mm. So how, that's, that's fantastic. To, first of all, I have a question about, you did mention how within sh- the, this realm of trauma, how it's, how it's brought down through, through language. However, isn't trauma or can be tra- trauma, I know some cases, and perhaps in my own life, is stuff that has happened to you. Like it's actual, it's physical. Oh, it of course, of it course. Happens. It's in reality. Of course, are you trauma saying, is reality. Are you trauma saying reality. Mm, it's the meaning we give it? Here's the key, Mayor. I can deal with pain. You can deal with pain. What I can't deal is with the stories I tell myself about my pain. And you know where we learned this from? The animal world, okay? If you ever watch National Geographic or you take visits to the jungle or you watch Planet Earth or all these wonderful videos about God's beautiful world. So the cheetah is chasing the impala, okay? One of three things happens. The impala gets devoured, the impala makes an escape, or the impala freezes by knowing that sometimes when you freeze, you startle the lioness or the cheetah or the leopard because they don't know what's going on. Why did you freeze? And they, they get scared and they go away and you can run away. They saw a fascinating thing. An impala or a zebra or an antelope freezes. The cheetah gets close to it, runs away. And now the zebra or the impala is there. It just came close to death. That's called a trauma. What do these animals do? They start shaking, (laughs) trembling for 30 seconds, for a minute, for a few minutes. And then they go back to the herd. And naturalists, scientists noticed that there was absolutely no indication in any form of any change of behavior. No displays of trauma in terms of connection. And they wondered what happened. And then they realized those 40 seconds of shaking it off was the end of the story. Animals are fortunate in the sense that they were not given the gift of language. Imagine the zebra would tell itself, you know why the cheetah is chasing me? Because I'm a horrible kid. In fact, I don't deserve to live. And that's why my mother insulted me yesterday, because she also thinks I'm not supposed to live, which is why my father kicked me yesterday, because he certainly doesn't believe I'm supposed to live, which in fact is proven by the fact that I was left behind because I'm anyway incapable and incompetent. I am a loser. Why am I even alive? The zebra doesn't go there. The zebra just knows that was scary. I'm not going back there again. (laughs) I can deal with pain. It's not easy. It's painful to deal with pain. Our souls are bigger than our pain. Our souls are infinite. I could contain my pain. The stories I tell myself about my pain, they paralyze me. They suck the spirit out of me. It's the language I tell myself about who I am and who I'm not. And then I live in that language and I never emancipate myself from it. And now, 40 years later, my wife tells me something. I'm not hearing what she says. My trauma is triggered and I'm responding from that place. I'm living in a prison. Mm. It's a very sad place to live in. So I always have to be able to align my posture with infinity. And that I would say is one of the most important and essential teachings of Judaism. Would you be able to give an example from your own life, if you're comfortable about it, of a, of a space and time that you had to work through to learn this lesson firsthand? Because you give oh, it off so beautifully. I, 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 I have to work on this every single day. Just to give one example. I grew up with a lot of pressure, a lot of expectation. I had some talents as a youngster and they were identified. 
and in a good Jewish family, you know, mm-hmm. pressure is on. The pressure is on. I grew up with a lot, a lot of pressure to succeed. And that's a struggle I had to work through. I still have to work through it because I had to succeed. And I felt that if I'm successful, that's what I'm going to be like. That's what I'm going to be loved. That's where I get my validation. What does success look like in the translation? Of success your- looked like in my world, it looked like powerful intellectual achievements, mm. excelling in school, excelling in whatever I did. Nobody expected of me to go into to big league football or, or, you know, or join the Super Bowl. That wasn't part of the Ashkenazic Jewish American expectations. Okay. But a lot of other expectations. You know, and then when I, I'm now speaking and communicating, right, very often there is those toxic thoughts can exist, you know, are the people liking me? Am I getting the validation of the audience? Mm-hmm. Which puts me right away into a prison. I'm living in a very small place. That's just one example. Are you not free from that now because of the success that you have today? That you are? So here's the rule. Success doesn't free you up from toxicity. Success can sometimes create much more toxicity because you start believing your own toxicity. It's one of the reasons why so many celebrities have miserable relationships and sometimes, unfortunately, have to uh, surrender to substances that are not very healthy for them. Because when you have been by a concert where 50,000 people are ready to worship, are worshiping you, mm-hmm. and even if you spit, they may, some of them will even lick your saliva, forgive me, and then you come home and your wife says, hey, take out the garbage. Whoa, 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 whoa. 50,000 people think I'm God and you're telling me to take out the garbage? Success doesn't heal wounds. It could sometimes, but not necessarily. Success can sometimes increase wounds. It's the inner work. It's the inner work that helps a person heal. So success is gratifying. Success is meaningful. But if it's not coupled with inner work, it's meaningless. I once went to visit Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael, who just passed away. Yeah a few months ago. Giant of a man. He was a giant of a man, a towering figure in the Jewish world, authored close to 80 books, translated the Talmud, first translated Talmud in English and Hebrew, you know, before before many other publishing houses did it, like Art Scroll, Masift, etc. Real pioneer and, and, and a great person. And I went to see him a number of years ago to consult him. He gave me time to come see him Shabbos afternoon in the backyard of his home in the German colony in Jerusalem. He had a little garden with some tree stumps that we sat on. And uh, we were schmoozing as the sun was setting Saturday afternoon, Shabbat afternoon in Jerusalem. And I asked him advice. I said, listen, I'm invited to travel around the world. I lecture to many audiences, young and old, Jews and non-Jews, religious and secular. I write a lot, I communicate, I want advice from you. You have been doing this work for years, you wrote, you you traveled, you lectured, could you give me advice? And one of the, he, 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 he shared with me a few insights, but one thing that I will forever remember is, <laughs> he was very funny and he could be cynical. And it really touches on what you're talking about. He says to me, he says, you know, they say that you're good. He tells me. I hear from my wife. He wouldn't say, I think you're good. Uh, That's okay. I hear from my wife that you're good. And you'll get better. He says, you'll get better. You'll, You'll perfect your skill. He says, you'll reach a point where when somebody invites you to a lecture, you won't even have to know the topic. Wow. What will happen is you're going to come up to the pulpit and on the pulpit is going to be a flyer with the topic. And then you'll go into the filing cabinet. Okay, we're talking about happiness. Okay, you'll take out the filing cabinet. Boom, an hour lecture. We're talking about marriage. Okay, we're talking about faith. Okay, we're talking about depression. Okay, whatever it is, Israel. He says, and it'll be wonderful. And you'll finish. You'll get a standing ovation. He said, most importantly, you'll get a nice check. You'll go home. You'll deposit it in the bank. And the next week, you'll go somewhere else for another lecture. 
And then he looks at me. He says, 25 years will pass. And one morning you will wake up and you will take a look in the mirror. And the only thing you will see is a mouthpiece, nothing else. And at that moment, you will know that you are a dead man talking. Wow. Because there's only a mouthpiece there. He says, that is what will become of you. And he says, I see this with many rabbis, speakers, teachers, educators, lecturers. They become a copy of their old self. All there is is a mouthpiece. The audience doesn't mind. They get their entertainment. But he says, but you'll be dead. That was it. As I said, Rabbi Steinsaltz, that's encouraging advice to put it uh, <laughs> a little cynically. What's, what's your suggestion? He said, my suggestion is don't speak to people. Don't give lectures. The first person you have to speak to is yourself. You have to be learning, challenging yourself, growing. Every day, create another challenge. Transcend your obstacles. Get out of your insecurities. Have real people in your life. And then you speak to audiences. He says, make sure that after 25 years, you don't only see a mouthpiece. You see a real person. How do you actually apply that? So when, when you, if a, if a client actually tells you, hey, we want to talk about X, Y, and Z, are you then challenging yourself in that topic in faith in, in marriage? Are you, are you looking into your own experience? Are you challenging that? How do you... I, I wouldn't put it that way. It's not like, you know, if he wants me to talk about marriage, I tell my wife, okay, I think I got to go to therapy. It's more what he meant and the way I took it and the way I try to apply it is just, just an ongoing, just in order to be able to, to give to people something genuine, I have to be genuine. So it's really constant inner work of being, of trying, trying at least to be real, to be authentic, to confronting my demons, my skeletons, my insecurities, my flaws, my weaknesses, to open myself up to genuine criticism of real people whom I respect. So what are some ways you do that? What are some ways that someone's listening now that you could, they could go ahead and, and start that sort of process of, of healing and growth? Right. Uh, I think well, for me, I, I could speak about myself. Yeah. I think for me, first and foremost, it's, it's real learning, real learning. I, 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 I spend a lot of time studying and learning, especially works of Judaism and the spiritual works of Judaism. Uh, the works of what's known as Ashkafa, Machshava, Musar, Kabbalah, Hasidic, Hasidus, the spiritual dimensions of Judaism, learning them, meditating on them, applying them, breathing them, and really practicing them. Another very important component is prayer. Prayer in the form of letting go, not prayer of just opening the prayer book and saying the words. That's wonderful, but I'm talking about prayer in terms of connection, really connecting, letting go and trying to align myself with my infinite posture allowing one of one of the most beautiful interpretations in Jewish mysticism on the word tefillah, the Hebrew word for tefillah is prayer, tefillah is prayer. The word we say is ani holech lehit palel, I'm going to daven, I'm going to pray lehit palel. What does palel mean? What does palel? In Hebrew, the word palel means anticipate it. Uh, J J Jacob tells Joseph before his death, re'ol panecha lo pilalti. I never imagined that I'll see your face. And now I see you and I see your children. Lehit palel, though, is referring it to the self. For example, if I'm dressing my child, I'll say, lahalbish. Lehit labesh is to dress myself. Lehit rachets is to bathe myself. So lehit palel is to surprise myself. <laughs> so what does that mean, lehit palel? To anticipate? What it really means is, tefillah is, to imagine my reality from God's perspective, to see myself from a pre-language vantage point, mm. to be able to see myself from a pre-trauma, pre-definition point of view, 
to see myself maybe the way God sees me. That's what prayer is. That's what I try to do during prayer. And it's not easy because the toxicity is always there. You know, oh, I'll tell you who you are. Yeah. You're this, you're that, you're that, you're that. Yeah, we, we love going there. Our trauma loves going there because it's a safe place, you know. Battered woman syndrome, uh, battered, battered man syndrome. Yeah. So prayer for me is very important. Meditation is important. And then there is listening, listening and learning from teachers, masters, colleagues, friends who really inspire me. It's very important for people. And today with, with, with the internet, it's one of the blessings that you don't have to have a teacher in close proximity. If there's somebody who talks to your soul, spend time with them every single day. Yeshiva.net. <laughs> Thank you. Spend time with them and get your spirit, get your spirit fired up. These are, these are the people, these are the messages, these are the texts you want to spend time with. The more we spend time in a world of innocence, the more that innocence will take root in our psyches. Let me ask you, what is, I mean, what would you say, you say so many things, right? You, you give so many different types of talks. If you have to con, con, concise into one thing, what are you trying to say in so many different ways? Wonderful question. If I can, if I can summarize what I try to say in one sentence is, each and every one of us is an indispensable note in the divine cosmic symphony. Never ever underestimate your value and always be in touch with the following truth. You are a divine ambassador in this world. You are an ambassador of infinity. You're not an ambassador of finiteness. You are an ambassador of infinity. You are never a victim of your circumstances. You are an ambassador of infinity that was sent into those circumstances in order to bring light into them. You are at every moment, in every situation, under all circumstances and within every encounter, see yourself as an ambassador of love, light, hope, healing, authenticity, and redemption. Which I, I had a follow-up question, which perhaps it, it gets answered here, but which I was going to say, what message is most important to be said to and spoken to to the youth? And then I was going to say with the elderly. It's, it's, it's really, it's a great question. What I think, I think there's actually, a, I think it's a similar message to the youth and the elderly, but the language I think changes. The youth must I think, identify this truth. Don't be afraid of any of your emotions. You are larger than all of them. Give yourself permission to experience whatever you experience and don't allow them to define who you are. That is so important. When that 17 year old boy or girl starts experiencing depression, melancholy, sadness, and so many other emotions, sometimes with mental illness, mood swings, sometimes dysfunctional families, which result in so many different depressions. And we become afraid of all these emotions. So we either have to numb them or repress them. And we get into these emotional confined traps and prison. Don't be afraid of any of your emotions. There's an amazing teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. He says that in Exodus, right before the splitting of the sea, Moses tells the Jewish people, don't be afraid of the Egyptians. Stand here and watch the salvation of God because you are seeing Egypt today. And because you're seeing Egypt today, you will never see them again. They ultimately end up drowning. And the commentators say, what an awkward way of saying this. Because you see them today, you'll never see them again. He should say, You'll never see them again. Obviously, they see them today. And the Baal Shem Tov said, no. It's because you have the courage to look at them today that you won't be able, that you won't see them again. If I have the courage to look at my emotions and not be afraid of them, I actually liberate myself from them. 
If I don't have the courage to look at my emotions, I repress them and now they leak out from everywhere in my life, but I have no control because they have now been relegated to the subconscious sellers of my psyche. Realize that you have the courage, you're larger than them. You can handle every emotion that comes your way. Do not be afraid of any experience because you're larger than it. And realize your power. You, are, you were sent here on a mission and at every single moment of your life, you can choose to be a victim or to be a prince. I think these types of messages are very, very crucial for the youth when they're said with heart and with genuineness and with authenticity, without judgment and without the need to impose ourselves on them and, and control them. Mm. I think with elderly people, what I have found is that these, these ideas resonate very deeply. And I think here the focus has to be, people have so many regrets. You know, you get older, I should have done this, I should have done that, I should have had this family, I should have had this marriage. This is not when you're younger, when you're older, all these expectations. And, and I get again another teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. The Judaism says, Rishayim Eleim Charatot. Wicked people are filled with regrets because they always do the wrong thing. So they always feel guilty. He said, no, no, no. Wicked people are filled with regrets mean people who are filled with regrets, it's not a sign of moral upstanding. You know why? Not because you're feeling guilty, because you basically don't realize that your expectations of life are completely erroneous. I'm busy regretting my past. I don't realize that my past was exactly where I was supposed to be to bring me to my present. So the ability to really embrace your life and say, wherever I am is where I'm supposed to be. This is where my mission is. It's what Mordechai told Esther in the story of Purim. You became a queen of the Persian monarch, not by mistake. You were placed here because this is your moment to shine. I know it wasn't the trajectory of your life, but can you let go of your old expectations and embrace your opportunity today? But for this, I have to transcend my ego and my insecurity. Is this, is this the Jewish version of the power of now, of being totally, fully present in this? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm actually, it pains me sometimes when people tell me, you know, that the power of now is a recent idea when every single day in our prayers, we state that God creates the world anew constantly, B'chal Yom Tomit, constantly every day. The Baal Shem to 300 years ago taught that to be a Jew, to be a human being, means to be in tuned with the creation of this moment. And if I'm living in yesterday's moment, in a way I'm dead because I'm not marching to the beat. I'm not aligned with the rhythm. And God is like, I'm creating you now. Why are you living in yesterday? Because yeah. yesterday I messed up. I goofed up. I'm a nerd. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Can you be alive now? You're a channel of infinity right now. In fact, I think it's one of the most fundamental ideas in Jewish spirituality to be completely in tuned to the calling of the moment, to the opportunity of the moment. The opportunity of the moment may look very different than what I would like it to look like. It may be my teenager telling me something very, very uh, difficult for me to hear. But that, that's the moment. That's the opportunity. Don't run away. Don't let your amygdala rep reptilian brain uh, create this fight or flight uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Don't lose the plot. Tune in. Take a deep breath. Anchor yourself. Sometimes you have to keep your mouth shut. And then ask yourself, what can I learn from this moment? How can I grow from this moment? What is my calling at this moment as a father or as a wife or as a husband or as an individual? Can I challenge two things? One of which is the, you mentioned that look, the regret aspect of like looking back and, and taking into account that everything that took place led you to this present moment now. But let's say that person is not happy with where they are right now. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and number two would be, and on what you just mentioned about 
staying in the pain, facing the pain, fight or flight, where is that line when you're saying, hey, and maybe that takes rigorous honesty and some guidance of, and, and I'm trying to answer the whole question, but how do you, where's that line between saying, yes, I gave it all my all, I, but it's just the pains, it's just coming back in ebbs and waves and time to leave, time to move on to the next thing. Right, right, right. Okay, wonderful question. Your first, remind me your first the question. Power, the power, in the sense of where one looking back at regrets. Oh, is, very important. Very they're important. They're not happy with their present moment though. Okay, so so I, I don't want to make this too abstract, but I'm just I'm just going to say this. I'm going to give the the one minute version of it, and I hope it can trigger all of us to you know to reflect on this more. One of the biggest problems in philosophy is how we reconcile divine providence and free choice. You know, am I calling the shots? Is is God calling the shots? You know. Who, who, who's making these decisions? Obviously, so much of life is based on genetics and, and based on environment, nature and nurture, and, and based on my chemical you know, chemistry, which is completely beyond my control. And every one of us has tools that we were given. You know, look at most mistakes of your parents or my parents or our grandparents. I mean, they were wonderful people, but yeah. they just had the tools that they had and no more. You know, and, and our trauma goes back 2,000 years. It's international, inter, intergenerational trauma, you know. And uh, you also come from uh, Russian families. Oh, and, yeah. And I, I literally just had a coaching session on my podcast. I turned into it with uh, Jerry Cornova. He's a, he's a CEO, whisper, he's known as a CEO whisperer. Long story short, he talked, he's like, I was talking about certain fears that I have in my life and being stuck. And he's like, let's go back to your grandparents. Let's talk about those pogroms. Let's talk about running away from Russia. And so we went down that conversation, but yeah, keep going. Yeah. So, so we have to have a lot of compassion. Really compassion is, is, is the word. Uh, the Alter Rebbe always writes in the Kutat Tairi says, the deepest attribute is the attribute of compassion. And he says something beautiful. I love what he says. He says, because compassion doesn't deny anything and it doesn't need to suppress anything. And yet it doesn't have to judge anything. That's the power of compassion. I don't have to deny you to be able to deal with you. And I don't have to extol you. I can create space for you and just have compassion. So it's a very, very powerful attribute. He calls it Midas HaRachman. So obviously a lot of that is, you know, beyond our control. And then there's the element of choice. Where do the two come together? And one of the deepest teachings of Kabbalah is that there are parallel universes that are going on simultaneously and they're paradoxical. In one universe, God decides and chooses everything. In the other universe, Rabbi Waiwai decides and chooses a lot of things. Now you'll say, it's a paradox. That's fine. We know today in quantum reality, paradox is the norm. Subatomic particles are clockwise and counterclockwise simultaneously. Light is a particle and a wave simultaneously. Schrodinger's cat is dead and alive, etc. They're both happening simultaneously. So, okay, great. Here's what happens. And here's a very profound idea. It could be misconstrued, but it should not. Even when I'm sinning, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm making a mistake. I'm doing something destructive. God himself told me in the Torah, don't do it. And the greatest Kabbalist said, you did it because you chose badly. But you know what? In another universe... God decided that you do it. Wait, 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 wait. This is ridiculous. Here is the deal. When I learn from my mistakes and I grow into recovery from all of my destructive and toxic behaviors and I transform those mistakes into springboards of humility, vulnerability, awareness, and love, retroactively, my ill-fated choices become aligned with God's choice. And that's what the Talmud means when it says that when you truly transform your life, your sins become mitzvahs. How? 
because my sins are sins from my perspective. From God's perspective, they were just a prelude for transformation. When I take my mistakes, when I take my failures, when I take those disastrous choices that I made in my life, and I turn them into springboards for health, for growth, for awareness, for recovery, for helping other people, retroactively, those mistakes now became success stories. You know that great story about Henry Watson. He was the, the chief of IBM. And they say that there was a manager who made a horrible business decision and he cost the company $10 million in losses. And he came in in the morning to Watson to give in his resignation papers and just leave the company. He felt horrible. Watson said, where are you going? He says, I don't want, you don't have to fire me. I'm just leaving, no severance pay. I, I just want to apologize. I, I wish I could pay you back, but I, I don't have $10 million. And Henry Watson says, you're not going anywhere. I just spent $10 million on your education. The moment a mistake becomes a moment of education, it may have been your greatest success story. And that's where faith comes in. If I could say to myself, I made a lot of mistakes and I may have destroyed my life. Some of us have made mistakes that destroyed our lives and may have destroyed the lives of people we love. I can live in that space. I'm a failure, I'm wicked, I'm evil, I'll burn in purgatory for eternity. You're detached from the real story. I made terrible mistakes. Now I, if I can go there and say, okay, but God also chose those mistakes. I'm not the only one who chose them. Why did he choose them? He chose them because somehow this is my path to become a source of light and inspiration. This is my path to my unique music that I have to bring to humanity and to the cosmos. And when I do that, I redefine retroactively my mistake so that it's now a different type of mistake. It's actually a mitzvah. Mm. This is a meditation that I think can help all of us, but for this, we have to let go of expectations. If I am stuck, in what my life was supposed to look like. You know, I was 20, this had to happen. I was 25, I was 30. Oh, 100%. I mean, I, I know myself, I, I replay certain tapes over and over and over again. I cannot forgive myself for certain mistakes that I did. And in those moments, if I was honest, I was operating from a place of fear or ego or, or a lower self, which I, I, I see the work of this forgiving myself, accepting myself, accepting reality and knowing that 100% that the things that took place in those moments, though in some parallel universe, I can say, what if this happened? I didn't say no to that relationship and that could have put me to where I am today and make more. Yes, all yes, that. yes. And that we all know that dialogue in our own version of our own lives. Yes, yes. Saying, That's what Abba Shem Tov said, that when you're filled with regret, regrets is coming from a place of weakness, not of strength. It was Shoyim Malayim Karatis. When you're really in touch with the deeper energy, you, you don't live with regrets. The question is why the question is not why was I so stupid? The question is, what can I learn from this? And how am I moving forward to be able to fulfill the mission for which my soul came down to the world? That's the question we want to ask ourselves. That's a real question. That's a good question. Without minimizing the pain that we caused ourselves or other people, other people caused us. In terms of your other question about, you know, fight and flight and the and, line between sticking around or when it's time to throw in the towel. Right. So it, it's so important to be able to be, as you said, be very honest with ourselves, number one, but also have a support system of people who care for us, but they also can challenge us, whether it's close confidants and friends whether it's, it's, it's great therapists or therapists, professionals, whether it's a rabbi, a mentor, mentors, people who care for you, they want to see your success, but they're also ready to challenge you. And they don't have that confirmation bias that you may have. 
I think we have to have these ongoing conversations to be able to process what is happening in our life and say, you know, maybe I need some feedback here to react differently. And is this relationship toxic? Is this relationship healthy? Is this about my trauma? Is this about something that's really not meant for me? These are conversations we have to have with ourselves, but with, with people who can help us let go of our own biases and blind spots to be able to see a deeper narrative. And, and don't get stuck with those people. And sometimes people go to a therapist, they start worshiping the therapist. If the therapist is not working for you, it's time to move on. You know, don't allow other people to make decisions for your life. It doesn't work that way. I need to hear feedback from other people, but I have to take responsibility for my life. And ultimately, the advice has to resonate with me. And I have to, I have to be the one who calls the shots. God created me because the buck stops here for me and the buck stops there for you. Mm. Understood. Understood. There is, um, before we start wrapping up, there was one uh, concept which I did enjoy. I deep dive. Again, it was hard to do research on you because I've, all your videos, it's hard to find a YY Jacobson video that's less than an hour. So to just let God, you know, I just. Double, I the, told you double speed was created for me. <laughs> for my lectures well there you go one so, of the miracles one of the miracles created for my lectures and some say triple speed even better it is about okay sign up before i get to the last point before i get to the closing where did you, the training the of how to speak so slowly we're the opposites i speed up i get quick i get excited is it natural or the, the preparation to train yourself to speak so eloquently to, to speak so slowly and to, to expand your vocabulary. Was that something that come naturally to you? Or was this? Yeah. So something? actually people ask me all the time. I never, yeah. I never took lessons. I never got uh, lessons on uh, speaking or communication. No Toastmaster class. No, no type no, of uh, no Toastmaster no. classes, no workshops, uh, no great professionals who taught me how to open, how to close, huh. take off my glasses, to wave my hands, how to cry, how to laugh, how to make jokes. Um, I never went to any of those uh, training sessions. Not that they're not wonderful. I just never went. It was really something inside of me that uh, was there from a very young age, I think. And But whenever I listen to masters or I read literature, I read books, I absorb. I say, this is how you phrase a sentence. I did that from a very young age. This is how you say it. This is how you phrase a sentence. Uh, yeah. I once asked the chief rabbi, of one, one of the great rabbis of Melbourne, Rabbi Chaim Gutnik. He was a great orator. So I once asked him, who was the greatest speaker you ever heard in the Jewish world? He didn't want to tell me initially. And then he said at the end, it was Zabatinsky. Zabatinsky was Zev Zabatinsky. He was a teacher of Begin. He was a revisionist. He believed in Jews being strong and fighting. They were very against the Haganah. He was ultimately exiled. He died in 1940. Shabatinsky created the network of real warriors in Israel who wanted to drive out the British and unconventional methods. And he was a brilliant orator. And uh, Rabbi Gutnick told me he was a student in Tells. Tells a Lithuanian yeshiva and Tells, very famous yeshiva. And Shabatinsky was coming to Tells to speak. He says, and all of us went to the lecture with eggs in our pockets because we knew that Jepotinsky was a secular Jew and he's going to try to persuade the yeshiva boys to leave yeshiva and go find other missions for their life. So we came with eggs. So when he starts speaking his heresy, we're going to hurl eggs on him. So what he told me, and he said, he opened his mouth. He said he spoke for four hours. And at the end of the lecture, we just felt the eggs oozing, oozing quite peacefully and silently below our garments. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I always tried growing up to be able to learn from the best, to see how to, how to say a phrase, to, to see how to build an idea, how to develop an idea. And I still uh, always try to learn. Beautiful. I hear that. Okay. So there is this, uh, I'm, I'm really pulling something out, but I, it just resonated with me deeply. And I, and I do hope that perhaps listeners will tie to this as well. Uh, from your talk on wishiva.net, how do I cultivate a positive attitude in life? It's a beautiful talk. And thank God I just 
scroll through, I clicked here and there, and I came across this one bit where you talked about Reb Aaron Carlin delving into the word Hamakim, a name, one of the names of Hashem, and how not to have a fight with space, with the space. I'm just abbreviating it. Would you be able to just touch on this idea, this concept? I think it's just so powerful. Beautiful, beautiful concept. There's an expression in the Talmud, in, in the Midrash, Sifri, your heart should not be fighting with the space. So Rav Aaron of Karlin, one of the great masters, another student of the market of Mizrich. It all ties together, Rabbi. It all ties together. It all ties together. He says, what is a strange expression? Your heart shouldn't be in a fight with God. God. He says, no, no, no. God is often called in the Talmud, Makom, the space. The ability, real faith means the ability to be able to make peace with your space. Geographically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. So much of our frustration in life is because I don't make peace with my space. I tell myself, if I would have only grown up in a more functional family, if my father would have only been X, Y, Z, my mother, my brother, my sister, if I would have only married such a guy or such a woman, if my in-laws, if I would have had these talents, these skills, this car, this type of this type of gene, this type of personality, if I only lived in warm weather, you know, you ran away to Los Angeles, I'm still here in, in New York, we have a huge snow here outside, we had almost two feet, a foot and a half, if I only lived here, if I only, if, 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 if my husband was easier, my wife was easier, my mother-in-law was this, my father, life would be great. So the Baron of Kalin says, the essence of life is stop fighting with your makam, with your space. Baruch HaMakam. Can you come to a place where you discover that this is the place Moses wants to get close to the burning bush. And God says, take your shoes off your feet because the place upon which you stand is sacred soil. The key is to be able to say the place where I am in right now my heart, my brain, with all of its issues, <laughs> my family, with all of its issues, my past, my present, my future, this is the place. This is where I can encounter God. This is where I can encounter my truth. This is where I can encounter my mission. This is where I can play my music. When I can really embrace that, then I will be able to see my space rather than a hindrance actually as the opportunity for me to shine. Hmm. Beautifully said. I, I love that. It's, it definitely resonates deeply. A lot of work. It's always, a, once you, you, you take the inspiration, and it sounds great in the moment, but then the moment you go back into real life or to just that critic, that voice comes back in and, and challenges. That, that's the challenge. That's We're the, overthinking. That's the, idea. That's the work. We're overtaken by anger, by laziness, by, by, by toxic, repetitive thoughts of how bad everything is. And we're triggered by people's responses. And that's why it's so important to be able to connect daily with a vision of yourself that is rooted in infinity. So that when the second part of the juggling happens, when you go from FM to AM, instead of getting flustered and overwhelmed, you could respond to it with uh, equanimity, with, uh, with focus, with balance, with love, with compassion. And, and I want to say, Mayor, you know, I have found from my life, and I see it constantly, people do not realize how much love they can give. We're all looking for love. We're all looking. We're all looking for something. You know, we all love that person to come over to me and tell me how, love, how lovable I am and we all want that in one way or another. We all want to belong. And, and it's important. But realize that one of the most powerful ways to touch that place in yourself is by you becoming that source of love. Mm -hmm. When people see you in the marketplace or in the synagogue or in the office or in the street or in the park, they'll look at you. You know what you want them to see? There is a lover. There is a source of love. There is a source of inspiration. There is a person. If you get close, you're going to get love. You become that person. And you know what will happen? You will fire up souls. 
Wherever you walk, you should be walking with a bag filled with seeds. You know how farmers walk around with the seeds and they just spread the seeds? That bag should be filled with seeds of love. And just wherever you see a person, just plant a seed. And you know what? You'll come back in 10 years and you'll see a bunch of trees of love have grown because you threw the seeds wherever you went. Don't be stingy. Don't be stingy to to hug people. I don't necessarily mean physically with Corona, but I mean virtually to compliment people, to uplift people, to believe in people, to say nice things to people, to do good gestures of, of kindness, of goodness. You will never realize the impact. People are yearning for it. And when there's such a source, they, they, they come flocking because the, the, this, is, this is what we each of us has to become. And you will, you, we, we cannot overestimate how powerful, how powerful that can be. Somebody once said, you know what love is? Love is learning the song of the people you care about. And when they forget that song, sing it to them. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Such a, uh, wow. You, you've spoken on such a variety of topics today. And I want to thank you for that. And you pulled out facts and names and dates. I mean, what are the, what are the challenges and, or downsides to, to having such a great memory? <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny question. Uh, I guess I remember a lot of things people say to me. <laughs> uh-huh. I guess I remember a lot of things people say to me. Uh, Listen, I absorb a lot. I absorb a lot, and uh, I could get it. I could get down. I can get into a very bad mood. Um, I could come off a great lecture where people were really moved, and internally, I'm empty. I pick up a lot of energy from people. I'm sensitive. I absorb a lot. Um, one of the most beautiful, beautiful teachings. I know we're, we're about to end every moment, but, but you trigger stuff in me. Uh, it, 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 it's, just, it's, just, it's just a great teaching. It, it's, I don't know, it's top of my book. Rabbi Yitzchak of Bardichev. He was a great Hasidic master. He died in 18, 1809 and uh, in Ukraine. Again, a student of the Maggot of Mizrich, right? I want to so say Carol Jung's Rebbe, but uh, <laughs> that that wouldn't fly so much. And and he says just something so beautiful. You know, today you hear it and people think it's like you know this new psychology. But he wrote this in the 1700s. It's it's printed in Kedusha Slavi, in 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 Shlach, in, in Numbers. Joshua sends two spies to to scout the land of Israel, and it says Margale Cheresh, death spies. Now. What's the use of sending deaf spies? I mean, spies have to listen. They got to pick up. Well, you don't send deaf spies. So there's different interpretations. Make believe you're deaf, you know, so people won't think you're here. He says something else. He says when sensitive people walk in a particular space, they can feel all the energy that was put into that space by anybody who ever walked there before. And they have to deal with it because they can confuse it as their own. So he said to them, you're going to be treading the same path like the spies that Moses sent 40 years earlier. He sent 12 spies and 10 of them were overtaken by fear and dissuaded the Jews from going into the promised land. When you follow the same path, you're going to feel their energy. Their energy may affect you. and You're going to have to be deaf to their energy. You're going to have to be emotionally sensitive to distinguish your energy from their energy, not to allow them to dictate your behavior. And I'm like, wow. Sometimes you come home from a wedding and you're in a bad mood and you're blaming yourself. No, you picked up the energy of 150 people who all have issues, just like you have issues. I'm not saying you don't have issues, but you have to distinguish. You got to be deaf. So this is this is part of this is part of living to be able to know. I have to own my energy. I'm responsible for my energy. I cannot own your energy. We have a, a 
We have a wonderful law in Judaism. Before Passover, we clean our house for chametz, for leavened bread. Yeah. But my responsibility is only to clean the places where I have chametz, not where you have. Psychologically, that's very healthy advice. So this is some of the stuff uh, I, and I think some of us have to deal with. Clean up house, beautiful. Well, Broadway Jacobson, thank you so much for your time, for your insights. This is the Great Day Podcast. And I, I realize now when I ask a question, it's more than just a yes or no. It turns into a whole drasha, which I'm grateful for. But if we can, what's a great day for you? Double speed was created for me, including this podcast. Double speed. <laughs> speed. Double speed is made for me. Oh, double speed. What's a great day for you? What's, this is the, what's a great day for you? A great day for me is, I would say, a day of alignment. <laughs> Simply a day of alignment. A day in which I'm operating from a deeper space of consciousness. I'm not responding to the pressures of the moment. I am not being reactive to the stress and to the anxiety inside of me or people around me, but rather I am operating from an inner awareness that I am an ambassador of love, light, and hope. Beautifully said. That's a good day. That's a great day. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. It's always about how you start over the day, you know. Starting over the day is so important. If the moment I wake up, you know, I'm on my phone, checking emails, getting overwhelmed, I often lose the plot. You have to start off your day from a space of, of deep connection and alignment. And then you can deal with every email. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and for showing up so powerfully today. Thank you for the privilege. And thank you for the opportunity, Mayor.